but we want to pray before we get started with this morning's message. Now, before I pray with you about 10 things everyone ought to know about the end of the world, which is going to come straight from the Bible, you know me, everything I preach is based on the Word of God. It's going to come straight from the Bible. I do want to share with you a funny but very true story to kind of get your head in the game as to the attitude that a Christian should really have about the goodness of God as we go through the end times. Okay, it's a funny but true story. And it has to do with a friend of mine. Now, she is 11, year old, 11 years old now, and she happens to be here at the recording studio with me. So I'm going to ask my friend Taya to come so she can show her face to you. She's as tall as, oh, <laughs> okay, well, I'm knocked out of sight. <laughs> She's as tall as I am these days. Okay, Taya, enough of that. All right, so anyway, that's my friend Taya. Okay. <laughs> and as you can see, she is a young lady who Jesus has given many talents and abilities, and she really does love the Lord. She's 11 now. But I want to tell you a story about when she was three or four years old, all right? When Taya was just three or four years old, I used to take her to my favorite restaurant, right? And those of you who know me, I hope you're saying Wendy's, Wendy's, okay? So I used to take her to my favorite restaurant when she was just a little peanut, you know, three, four years old. And we'd get some French fries and some chicken nuggets, and I'd get one of my iced teas, and we'd sit there and talk. And one of my goals with young people, when I'm able to have an influence in their life at that age, is to show them that it's not just Jesus died on the cross for your sins. It's Jesus is Lord of the universe. I, I want people to understand the full gospel, not just part of it. And so uh, we would go and we would talk and we'd talk about Jesus. And of course, she was fully aware that Jesus had died on the cross for her sins and she even knew that he had risen from the dead. And so I, one day I was talking to her and I said, you know, uh, Jesus did rise from the dead after he died on the cross for our sins. And do you know where he went after that? And we came to the conclusion that he went back up to heaven. And I said to little Tay, and I remember she's just three or four. And I said, now, uh, after a while, Jesus is going to come back down from heaven. He is going to come back down to this earth. You know, and her eyes were getting pretty big at this point. And I said, yeah, he's, he's going to come back down. Actually, he's going to fix everything. I said, when Jesus comes back down to this earth, he's going to make it so that you never get boo-boos anymore. Nobody ever fights anymore. Nobody's ever sick anymore. I said, he's going to come back and fix this world. And I said, and do you know what he's going to do to start fixing it? And, you know, her eyes are getting bigger and bigger as we're talking. And I said, Jesus is going to come back. And when he does, he's going to take the devil. And he's going to throw the devil in a bottomless pit. Now, I don't know at three years old if you understand what bottomless is or not. But, you know, I'm talking about, I'm saying this pit is just going to be so deep. He can't ever get out of there. And he's going to throw him in that pit. And Jesus is just going to take over the world and he's going to make everything right. Well, at this point, she's getting so super excited. Okay? So our lunchtime was over and I needed to return her to her mother. And being the very humble person that I am, when we got to her mom, I said to Taya, tell mommy what you learned about Jesus today. And so I will never forget this moment. Taya starts telling her mom how Jesus is up in heaven now, but he's coming back again, and he's going to make everything right, mommy. Nobody's going to fight. We're not going to cry anymore. We'll get boobies anymore. And you know what Jesus is going to do with the devil when he comes back? And she looked at her mom as serious as could be. She did the motions. She said, he's going to take that devil, and he's going to shove him in his armpit. <laughs> Never forget that. Okay, so somewhere in the translation, the pit changed just a bit from bottomless to armpit, but never fear because depending on whose armpit that might be, this could be a very bad thing for the devil, right? Okay, now that cute little story, true story, uh, I wanted to share with you because it really does set the tone. 
It really does. In actuality, Jesus is coming back. And he is going to do the devil in. All right? And Jesus is going to make this world right. And until that moment, until we see that reality happen, we as Christians need to keep 10 important points in our mind. These are pivotal points that you will be able to talk about with your unsaved, unbelieving friends. They're simple, they're understandable, and based on scripture. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to just be with us in a special way. Dear God, we need you this morning. There is nothing that I can say that will bring hope to anybody. It is about what you have to say, dear Lord. And I'm praying right now. I know we're having a revival on Saturday, but I'm praying right now, this Sunday morning, that you would create a revival in the hearts of many. For every person who is watching and everyone who will watch the recording and everyone that will talk about this message, I'm praying for a true revival in our hearts that we might live in the victory that you have for us, Lord God. That we might approach current events and the times in which we live with an excitement for who you are and for what you're doing. Jesus, I pray that you would save many from their sin. That you would become the Lord of many lives. And Father, I'm just asking that you would sweep across our hearts. Change the very landscape of our hearts. That we might have a brand new, renewed hope. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 that we have been born again into a living hope. When we get born again into your kingdom, we must breathe in hope. And my prayer, Lord, is that your Holy Spirit would deliver that hope this morning right through this internet, right through these airwaves by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys for praying with me. Thank you for joining in. It means the world to me every week as I'm praying for you before Sunday morning and certainly every Sunday morning as I'm getting ready to come on, I think of how it would not be the same if you were not there with us watching. So we're so very grateful for you and I'm thankful you've tuned in to this particular message. We're going to go over the first two points of 10 things everyone ought to know about the end of the world. Point number one, and by the way, I don't want you to feel like you have to scramble to take notes on this. I want you to know that I will be talking to our technical department and we'll be putting a free outline of these points and scripture verses on our website so that you don't feel like you have to write it all down. But the first point is this, the end of the world will not be a random tragedy. The end of the world has a purpose. Can I get an amen out there for those of you who know the Bible? The end of the world is not going to be a random tragedy. The end of the world has a purpose. Don't take for granted that everybody understands that. I mean, I'm out there on TikTok all the time with videos and things, and I talk to young people a lot, and, you know, uh, I've been in, it worked with teenagers my whole life, and I'm going to tell you what, there is an angst that is building up in our world among not just kids and teens, but adults, People are fretting, people are worrying, and people are thinking, what's the end of the world going to be? Are we going to have a nuclear war? You know, what's going to happen? And the first thing that I want everyone who believes in Jesus Christ to know is, the end of the world will not be a random tragedy. The end of the world has a purpose. This world is going to end when God says it ends, and it is going to end as he says so. As a believer... You need to know and share with your unsaved friends and share with your kids and your grandkids this fact. God is going to end this thing. Amen? He is going to end it. Now, if you were to get on the internet and search, if you were to talk to the average person, what do they fear in terms of the world? You know, so many people are afraid if we don't take proper care of the environment, you know, the earth is just not going to be able to support us. I want to tell you that, yes, Christians are to be good stewards of what God has given us, but we do not fear hyper-environmentalism. God made this world, and this world will supply what it is supposed to supply until the day God says it's going to end. Amen? Now, our obedience is certainly a part of that, but God is the sustainer. But I want to share with you this morning, if you search, you know, different ways that the world is going to end, 
uh, a very famous person who right before he died, I, think, I believe he passed to the next world in March of 2018. But before Stephen Hawking died, how many of you know the name Stephen Hawking? Okay, uh, very famous, very brilliant physicist, cosmologist, mathematician. Now, sadly, that we know of, unless there was some type of deathbed conversion that we know of, Stephen Hawking never submitted his intelligence to the one who gave him his intelligence. Never submitted it to Jesus Christ. He was an atheist. But here, but he is highly regarded in our world as a brilliant thinker. And, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking posited a number of ways that he thought the world might end. And I want to share those with you because these are popular, well-respected beliefs on how it might end. First of all, Stephen Hawking said, I believe by around the year 2600, he felt that population growth and our electricity use and global warming would just kind of come together and the whole earth would kind of just turn into a giant fireball, all right? Massive overheating and the world is just going to burn. And I know that that's a prominent thought today and people are so worried that that might happen. The earth is just going to get too hot and it's going to explode. Another theory that Stephen Hawking put out there, which I can understand why, you know, artificial intelligence is a big thing today. If you haven't looked into it, man, it's crazy. Using artificial intelligence, and we're creating artificial intelligence that's able to replicate itself and able to improve. And he had the fear that maybe someday artificial intelligence was actually going to take over humanity. Okay, so that's another belief and a fear that some people have. And I don't know if, you, if you're watching what's going on today in terms of the technology that's being put into place People may not realize that's what they're doing, but technology is being put into place for the coming Antichrist. You know, the, uh, the, the Neuralink, the chip in your head, all kinds of things. But this is one thing that people worry about, that they fear. Another thing that Stephen Hawking felt might happen is because of man's inhumanity to man and the amount of technology we have for weaponry, he of course thought that perhaps the earth would end because of nuclear war. And I know that that can be a very common fear. I mean, we know the hatred that is in the world today. We know the technology that is at the fingertips of many nations and people might fear nuclear war. So these are just some of the ways that people talk about the world ending. Some of the things that people fear. And, and, and I want you to, to just have in your mind that as a Christian, we never have to sit around and think, well, I wonder what tragedy i wonder what random thing i wonder what accident is going to take place i mean who's going to accidentally start a nuclear war who is going to you know usher in this artificial intelligence takeover i mean at what point will the earth become so hot that it explodes i mean we don't need to worry about that because it's not going to be a random tragedy god is in control now here's the key thought that i want you to keep in mind and remember, Stephen Hawking himself was atheistic in his thinking, and so many people are. I mean, there are many people who think that they're Christian, but really, in the core of their worldview thinking, they don't think Christianly. And when I advertised this session, I did say, if you have teens or preteens that are being taught evolution, this is a good session for them to listen to. Because it's important for us to not only claim to be Christian, but think Christianly about all things including biology, including origins. So I have a key thought that I placed up here for you. Um, you know, years ago when I taught uh, high school in Christian school, I, uh, I had a secular humanist worldview. Uh, we would analyze right in there the Marxist or Leninist worldview, the Christian worldview. And when you analyze these worldviews according to what the Bible says. So this key thought that I have to share with you is very basic to how a Christian needs to think. Ready? If you accept time, chance, and eternal matter as the source of the start, then you can very readily accept time and chance as the source of the end. Now, I'm going to explain that in a minute, but I want you to think about that. If a person is evolutionary in their thinking, and they would agree that time, chance, and matter 
was the source of everything, then I could see why they would think that time and chance and that same matter might be the source of the end. And that's where that thinking comes from. Now, I'm a very visual person, so I want to use a visual for you here, some graphics that I made con concerning this. All right, um, here we are. Let's say that this is the existence of the earth as we know it from its beginning to end. And let's assume that we're thinking from the perspective that there is no God, no supernatural mind, no supernatural being behind us or behind the universe. And that's what a true humanist, a true atheist believes, that we humans and the matter, the world that we live in is all that exists and that we must solve our own problems. There is no supernatural being behind any of this. So if you believe that there is no God and you believe that this is our existence, uh, then I'm going to propose, and, and this is true, that you must believe that there had to be some eternal matter somewhere back there and randomness and time that formed the world that we now know. And I put a bunch of squiggly lines here because that's, that's kind of messy. It's kind of crazy to think about. Uh, and, I, and I call the matter eternal because I want you to realize something. If there is no God, if there is no supernatural force behind the universe, and yet we're here, then you are not believing in a supernatural or eternal God, but you are believing in eternal matter. Because nothing in this world comes to exist out of nothing. Nothing in this world comes to exist out of nothing. And so the matter must have always been there if there was no creator behind it. Okay? So that eternal matter, at some particular time, when you factor in a bunch of randomness and billions and billions of years, these people believe that somehow that non-living material began to organize itself. Imagine, without a supernatural mind behind it, it began to organize itself, become more and more complicated, become more and more organized until we have a universe, galaxies, we have an Earth, we have humans. It's, it's really when you... A very illogical belief. However, if this is what you're going to believe, then you also believe that this massive disorganization, this original primordial soup or these few molecules that began banging together and moving around through no supernatural force, you believe that that disorganization suddenly became an organized universe. I mean, here we are. The earth works. It rotates around the sun, okay? As much as people want to put down God's creation, it's working pretty well. So we have this organized existence right now. However, if you believe that this is the beginning, how easy would it be for you to believe that if there's no mind or God superintending this whole thing, that at any minute, through randomness and over time, this whole thing could go back to disorderliness and mass destruction. All right, does that make sense? If there's no God, then somehow this matter, without any great mind behind it, organized itself, turned into some inexplicable orderliness, and I don't know how uh, atheists truly account for that. It's crazy to think about. But if it started like this, and there's no God behind it ordering anything, then how easily could it simply end in the same way and go back to mass destruction? And I believe, after studying worldviews for a large part of my life and teaching it for many years, after being in churches and seeing how little Christians understand of biblical thinking concerning philosophy and biology, I truly believe that this is why so many people are scared today of the end. Because this type of thinking has even come into the church. You know, public school systems are teaching secular humanism. They're teaching evolution. What you believe about the beginning is absolutely necessary for what you believe about the end. And if you don't get it squared away with your children, if you don't 
have them understand this fact of how this is wrong thinking, they're going to end up being afraid of the end. And with very good reason. All right? However, I want you to think about something. If you accept the purpose of a sovereign God as the source of the start, then you can accept the purpose of a sovereign God as the source of the end. Amen? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, everything in this universe that we know of that exists had a start. But God exists outside of the universe. We believe in the supernatural starter and initiator of the universe. And that makes so much more sense. Because the fact that there is a supernatural God with a mind behind this world explains our own minds, the existence of our ability to think. It explains the orderliness, the precision of the universe. Everything that is necessary for it to be what it is today, including the elliptical way that the earth and the planets rotate around the sun. Everything in such detail enabling life on this planet because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm going to submit something to you. Talk to your kids. Talk to your grandkids. Talk to your friends. If a person does not accept Genesis 1-1 and they believe in evolution, all their other thinking about the Bible and about the, the, our present time and about the future is going to be twisted. You got to get this one right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, Psalm chapter 90 verse 2 tells us that God is eternal. It says, before the mountains were born, okay, before the earth ever existed, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. Now, this can't fit into our brains because we are finite. We are the created. He is the creator. But God is timeless. He exists outside of time and space. That's why he was able to create time and space. So God is eternal. He is everywhere in the past. He is now with us. He is the great I am. He is all places at once in all time. He is in all past. He is in the present and he is in the future. He is eternal God. Psalm 90 verse 2. All right. And with that as our worldview, with that as our premise, we know that for a time there was no world. Now, people say, you know, why did God choose to create the world exactly when he did? And this is a question that's very hard to answer because God is timeless. You know, we think of how many years must have been, you know, before God created the world. But remember, God doesn't endure through time like we do. But at one point, God decided to create the universe. Before the universe, what was there? There was God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the blessed Trinity. They were able to love one another. That's, you know, God is love. How was God loved before he created the world? Who did he love? He loved each, each they, God loved himself, each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect unity. So God existed before there was a world. And then he chose to bring the world into existence. You say, Shelly, that's a lot to take in. Listen, logically, that is a lot easier to take in than the fact that matter, molecules, some primordial soup existed forever. Never had a creator, never had a beginning. Material stuff always was and then began to organize itself over time. Okay? We're talking about God here. So this eternal God uh, existed when there was no world, and then at a given point, he decided to create the world. And when I say create the world, the Bible says, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning of what? The beginning of space and time. God created space, time, and matter, all from his own hand out of nothing. And so at one point, God created the world. Now, God is perfect. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, perfect. He's organized. He is supernatural God. When he created the world, we think exactly opposite of the evolutionists. 
we look at the space that we now live in and say, it doesn't look very organized and good as far as morality goes, as far as what the world could be. We look at it and say, the mess is here, right? The mess wasn't back there. The mess is now. Can I get an amen out there? Okay, now from, from the perspective of God created the world that is able to sustain itself and precisely working, yes, amen, that's beautiful. But the world is a mess, my friends. Because of sin, everything is falling apart, right? Evolution says everything just continues to get better and better. I'm sorry, it looks like everything's getting worse and worse. The world is winding down. Our bodies are winding down. Our morality is winding down. Things are wearing out. Things have gone haywire. And the Bible gives us the reason. That's because of our sinfulness. So evolutionists, you know, they begin with the messiness here. And they say, this world is the best it is. And it might just self-destruct at one point. We Christians say, God is perfect. He knows a perfect world. He created us and our sin messed it up. But one day it's going back to perfection. Hallelujah. Praise God for this. Listen, Matthew 24, 14. Jesus said in this famous chapter about end times, Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Everybody see that there? Then the end will come. We're in the mess now, but God is going to get his good news out to all nations going to give everybody a chance to respond to his gospel, and then God is going to bring this thing to a close. That's a Christian worldview, that the God who started it is the God who will end it. And he obviously has a purpose in doing so, and he has a time frame in doing this. Now, next week, we're going to get more to the, the pattern of the birth pains of the end times, but suffice it today to say, God knows the moment he is going to begin to close this thing up. He has a plan in place. The gospel will go out and then the end will come. Amen. God has it planned. It's not going to be a random accident. In Revelation 21, the apostle John corroborates what Jesus is saying there. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Remember God had given the apostle John a vision of the end, a vision of the new heaven and new earth. While he himself was exiled on the slave labor camp of Patmos because he was a believer. John, the apostle, had this vision. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Okay, this world as we know it has an end. It's gonna pass away. He goes on to say in verse five, he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things New, hallelujah. Do you know that word means perpetually new, forever new, never wearing down, never wearing away. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful thought? The newness of everything forever. But I'm showing you here that Jesus said, this has got a time frame on it. The end will come. The apostle John got a vision from God that said, I saw a time when there was a new heaven and new earth and the old one was gone. Hallelujah. Because God is going to make all things new. So look at the visual from this perspective. Perfection, holy God from eternity past, creates a universe because of our sin and our rebellion. This thing gets messy, but praise God, he's got an end point in mind, not some random accident. All right? Not some random accident. God is going to superintend this end. And then eternal God is going to create a perfect world. Hallelujah. Back to perfection. From perfection. Stuck in the mess for a time. Back to perfection. Now I hope some of you uh, who, are, who are graphic thinkers as I am. Visual thinkers. All right. I hope that you see the difference between these two worldviews. I'm going to put it here up on the screen. I want you to think about this. Keep this in your mind. According to an evolutionary or atheist viewpoint, we go from somehow this eternal matter over billions of years without any supernatural mind behind it organizes itself from a mess over all that time into the world in which we now live and then 
At any moment, that same mess could implode, an accident could happen, and it all falls apart. That is a non-biblical worldview. The biblical Christian worldview is exactly the opposite. It says there is an eternal God, a supernatural mind behind all this. And he created it at a specific point. And through our rebellion against him, we messed it up. This mess is what we live in now, but we look forward to him ending it on his terms and ushering in a perfect world once again. My friends, which looks better to you? Hallelujah. Listen, if you are an unbeliever, if Jesus Christ is not your savior, this world right now, it's the best you will ever know. This is it. This is, in effect, your heaven. And I'll tell you what, that's pretty sad. Because every day we endure the brokenness, the pain, and the misery of this life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this current world is the worst you'll ever know. This is as bad as it will get for you. And in the new world, perfection, everlasting joy. Hallelujah. Two very separate worldviews. Okay, so point number one was this, just to review. The end of the world will not be a random tragedy. The end of the world has a purpose. Amen. And that fact is rooted in how you view the start of the universe. Hallelujah. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is letting that sink into some of your hearts. And I pray that many of you will have the opportunity to share that to even share that visual with somebody that they might understand. Point number two, and we're only going to do two points today, so this is my second and last point for this morning. I really wanted to slow this down so that it could all sink in. Point number two, the end of the world is not a point of termination, but a point of colossal change. All right, Not a point of termination, but a point of colossal change. You know, so many times when people speak of the end of the world, they think apocalypse, disaster, tragedy. And, and so many people think end, like that's it. It's shut off. It's gone. Nothing more. I remember being in a restaurant when I was originally working on this uh, series. And I remember sitting behind a young adult, and I think she was talking to her mom. And she was pretty much telling her mom, you know, I... I believe that when you die, that's it. It's over. There's a lot of things that went through my mind. And I don't say this glibly, but first of all, if that's what you believe, you're in big, big trouble. Because life does not end when you die. Life is just beginning when you die. Either eternal life or eternal damnation, okay? But a lot of people believe that when they die, that's kind of the end. They just cease to exist. They're not conscious anymore. Uh, conscious anymore. Their body is gone, failed them, and it's over. And, and a lot of those people think the same thing about the universe. If they don't believe that their soul is supernatural, then they also don't believe in a supernatural God, and so they just think when the world is over, it's done. The end of the world is the end. Shut off. No. Actually, the word end, as it is often used in the New Testament, means not a point of termination, but a point of fulfillment. That word end often in the Bible has more to do with something coming to be what it was always intended to be. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the end of the world. Now, Revelation eleven fifteen. This is a scripture verse that you ought to commit to memory. Now, this is a scripture that will be fulfilled in the future. But how many of you know that what God has written in his word is as good as done? Hallelujah. Amen. What God writes is as good as done because God is timeless. That's why we're seeing so many prophecies fulfilled that God had already written in his word. Okay? He speaks only truth, whether it's regarding the past, the present, or the future. And so one day, this verse 
will be recited by us who are Christians. We will actually be able to say this verse and we will have seen it happen with our own eyes. Revelation 11:15, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. There will be a day when I, Shelley Prindle, will stand and say this, and I pray that you will be able to as well. And maybe we can stand near each other on the day we say it. Say, hey, remember we talked about that. In 10 things, everyone ought to know about the end of the world. One day we will stand and say, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. There is a day when we will stand somewhere and say, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And now he's going to reign forever. What does that mean? The depth of this verse is so significant. What does it mean that the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord? There's some type of change that happens here when the kingdom of the world as we now know it switches into and becomes the kingdom of our Lord. I want you to think about the kingdom of our world today. When you think about the world as it is right now, in its sinful rebellion against God, in this age in which we live, I want you to think about this world. The kingdom of our world is rocked with war. Now, this is obviously a picture of war back when war was done with hand-to-hand -hand combat. You think of the number of men and, and women and children who have been killed through war. War between nations, civil wars, a clashing of kingdoms and worldviews. When you think of war and all that it has brought, the pain, the devastation, the division, the hatred unbelievable war is a huge part of the kingdom of this world as a matter of fact as we're going to learn in some sessions down the road god is going to end all wars with a war of his own hallelujah this is what the kingdom of the world that we live in now is like and believe me nobody nobody is going to be able to bring peace to this earth until jesus christ brings peace to this earth did you hear me? No one is going to be able to bring peace to the earth until Jesus Christ brings peace. The Antichrist is going to, he's going to cry out peace. He's going to swoon people by proclaiming he can bring peace, but then he's actually going to turn on people and demand to be worshipped. He's actually going to rally a great war against God himself. And then he's going to lose. <laughs> And everybody on his side is going to lose. And the devil's going to go down. There is going to be no peace until Jesus Christ brings peace. This is the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world, not only is it wrought with war and fighting, but the kingdom of this world is a kingdom of greed. God warns us over and over again not to love the world or the things in the world. Not he warned, Jesus himself said, you can't love both God and money. You either love the one and hate the other or despise the one and serve the other. Okay? You cannot love the world. But this kingdom, the world that we live in now, it's all about greed. It's all about people doing whatever they have to do, tramping on whoever they have to tramp on, working until they can't even enjoy themselves because we just want more and more and more. It's all about stuff and materialism and greed. The kingdom of this world, need I say it, is full of disease and sickness and pain and growing old. That marks the kingdom of this world. And as we recently learned, even pandemics can sweep through and sickness can come to us on a massive scale. If you're living for this life, for this world, if you live by the philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, this is the best it is, what a very sad outlook. War, greed, materialism, sickness, misery, dying, natural disasters, natural disasters, tsunamis, 
And what about the horrendous, horrendous wildfire, wildfires that are happening in our own country? We think of hurricanes. We've got tropical storms. We've got natural disasters of all kinds. Earthquakes. That is the kingdom of this world, my friends. And it is not going to end until Jesus comes back. And then finally, for me, this is the most devastating of all. The kingdom of this world is marked with loneliness, misunderstanding, confusion, regret, emotional pain, angst. Are you with me out there? That's the kingdom of this world. That's the stuff that marks the kingdom of the world in which we now live. And so I stand on the holy word of God when I tell you, one day we will say the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. We want the kingdom of this world to be inverted. We want the kingdom of this world to be changed into the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And you can see why. Now let's talk about some scripture to corroborate Revelation eleven fifteen. We always let scripture interpret scripture. So I go to Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, where the apostle John uh, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so poetically tells us that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Never a funeral again. Never a hospital again. Never a counselor, a psychiatrist again. Never a medication again. Never a, a word of gossip again. Never will anyone be slandered again. Never will anyone be misunderstood again. Hallelujah. No more poverty. No more jealousy. I can't even imagine. And yet the Bible says that it is true. Romans chapter 8, verse 21, we go to another uh, uh, book of the Bible, letting scripture interpret scripture. The apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 28, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. Do you understand that right now, the world that we are in, because of our own sinfulness, is in bondage to corruption. It's in downgrade mode. Things are not getting better. See, you see how hideous Satan is? He has so many people believing the lie, the delusion of evolution, which teaches that things are getting better and better when actually things are getting worse and worse and they're completely falling apart. But if the devil can get people to believe because of evolution that things are getting better and better and one day humanity is going to become even better than it is now, then they'll blow off the thought of God and believe that lie when actually everything's going to crash. Everything's going to completely get worse. Morality is on a downfall. The world is wearing out. And if he can get people to believe it's getting better when it's really crashing, then they will never look to God as being their hope because they think hope is in humanity. That's humanism. It's a lie from the pit of hell. This creation is in bondage to corruption because of human sinfulness. But praise God... Through Jesus, God paid the price that we get out of this corruption. Hallelujah. And God remakes the universe. In Isaiah chapter 11, go to an Old Testament prophet here. Isaiah 11 is actually a prophecy about the millennial reign of Christ. Not quite the new heaven and the new earth, but the thousand year reign of Christ after the battle of Armageddon. But whatever is true of the millennium is, is, is infinitely better in the new heaven and new earth. But when Jesus comes to reign literally as king from Jerusalem on this earth, the Bible says that things are going to change so greatly, watch this, that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. 
My friends, there's going to be a day when Bambi doesn't have to worry about the wolf coming to eat him. There's going to be a day when even the animal kingdom will be at rest and at peace. How beautiful is that? How wonderful is our God? And a little child shall be able to lead them. A wolf, a leopard, a little child playing with them, leading them as he would, you know, walk his dog. Wow. This is in the Bible. Isaiah 11 goes on to say, The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. What? The nursing child will be able to play with snakes. And all of us women out there are like, ah. <laughs> But honestly, when Jesus reigns, there is peace even in the animal kingdom. What a world is coming to us contrasted to the kingdom of this world in which we now live. Isaiah 11, 9 says, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Praise God. When even the animal kingdom and the natural world itself and humanity will come under the true knowledge of God and be as Jesus wills it to be. Hallelujah. What a world is coming to us. My favorite disciple, Peter, tells us in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 13, another one of my absolutely favorite verses. According to God's promise, look at this, my friends, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Hallelujah. Now that word righteousness, a lot of people think that's some boring religious word, but righteousness really means to be right, to be as it ought to be. You know, I long for the day, uh, I've lived 37 years with type 1 diabetes, and I long for the day when my, when my pancreas functions as it ought to function. When my pancreas is righteous, so to speak. It's made right through the God, the creator who made it. Hallelujah. We can't wait for the day when relationships work right, when they are as they ought to be. Who can't wait for that? We can't wait for the day when the natural world itself works as it ought to work, when it is as it should be, as God intended it to be, and the tectonic plates no longer shift under the weight of sin. There are no more earthquakes, no more natural disasters, no more pandemics, no more wars, no more greed, no more loneliness. Hallelujah. We are going to a home when God turns the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of his Christ. It is going to be an earth and a heavens in which righteousness dwells, where everything is as it ought to be. That is what we are looking forward to. And I know it's a lot to fit into your brains, but my friends, it's true. I'm standing on the word of God as I tell you this. Here's a key thought. It's the end of the world as we know it, but not as God knows it. Because God knows a perfect world. Listen, you don't know a perfect world. I don't know a perfect world. But God does. The end of the world as we know it is just the beginning of the world as God knows it. Hallelujah. I don't want you to be unsettled. I don't want you to be shaken by the end time events we're seeing around us because our God is real and our God has a plan. Amen. Point number two. Let's go back and summarize it. The end of the world is not a point of termination, but a point of colossal change. 
Amen. God is so good. Those are our first two points for 10 things everyone ought to know about the end of the world. Number one, the end of the world is not a random tragedy. The end of the world has a purpose. And number two, the end of the world is not a point of termination, but a point of colossal change. Praise God. Listen, it is very important that each of us, as good stewards, pray and ask the Lord Jesus what he would have us do for his kingdom. And I'm going to ask you to pray for me and for Hope and Passion Ministries and to ask Jesus if he would have you give financially to support this ongoing broadcast. This is what I do as my full-time calling to the Lord. And I love doing it. And he is providing for us through your gifts, your donations, your offerings. And so you can give online. You can go to hopeandpassion.org and give online. Or you can send a donation, a word of encouragement in the mail to us. We're in Irwin, Pennsylvania. But I do ask that you would ask the Lord if he would have you to give. I certainly want to pray over you before we go. I, I am asking uh, the Lord Jesus to let these scriptures, let his word sink deeply into your heart. Because as we continue to see end time events happen, and believe me, my friends, as we're going to learn next week, next week's session includes a discussion of the birth pains of the end times. As we continue to see these things grow in intensity and frequency, you have hope. You have hope. Hallelujah. Because God's word is true. I'm praying that these scriptures and these thoughts will be deeply embedded in your spirit and in your mind. And that I'm going to pray that God will give you opportunity to share these truths with people in your life. Amen. Lord God, this morning, I just want to thank you so much for the time that we have had together. It's been wonderful time. I've sensed your Holy Spirit moving and working. And I, I want to pray a blessing over every person who's watching. The greatest blessing that we must pray for is that each person has called upon Jesus as Savior to forgive their sin and to make them right with God. You, the creator, the supernatural God behind this universe. I pray that if anyone has not asked you to save them from their sin, that they would in this moment. And that they would know that the God who created this world and is soon to recreate the perfect world is their God through Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, I pray a blessing on each one who knows you that we might grow in godliness, that we might grow in the power of your Holy Spirit to witness, to take this gospel to all nations and to make disciples of everyone that we can. Lord, bless us, I pray. Instill a deep, deep hope. Erase fear through the truth of Jesus Christ, his word. And I thank you in his name. Amen. God bless you. I pray that you'll be with us again next week for part two. Please share this on Facebook if you would. Invite friends to attend. Next week we'll go to part two of 10 things everyone ought to know about the end of the world. Have a great week in Jesus.